So this context of this reading, just to start us off with, which tells us a little bit about what we're doing uh, tonight. This is, uh, there's been an outpouring of God, the Holy Spirit, a supernatural outpouring uh, of him among his people. People weren't too sure what was going on. And Peter gives an explanation. As he comes to the end of it, he says this. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to that number daily. Amazing, that call was for all people. We've got people tonight responding to that cry, what should we do? And they've heard the message, you'll hear it a bit tonight. And Peter said, repent, turn to God. That's what it means, to change your mind. Uh, Repent, trust in the cross and be baptised and you'll be filled with the Spirit of God, that power that comes from God. That's what they're about tonight. So uh, let's uh, stand and sing as Katie leads us in our song worship. We've got more later, more worship later. We can't stop worshiping, it's fantastic. But um, anyway, it's really good to come worship God, isn't it? And really sing praise to him, so that's great. Um, now, you might, some of you won't know me. Uh, you're the lucky ones, uh, the others do. Um, but my background was in broking, in stocks and shares, uh, worked in the city for a number of years. And then I got married, so things improved. And, um, and as part of that, as part of the... Uh, not really a deal, um, I was into deals, but the minister said, look, do you want to come on an Alpha course? An Alpha course uh, is something that we run here. We've got leaflets out there. Alpha, Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. For many people, that's the beginning, so that's what my journey was. I went on this Alpha course, and um, I was quite critical. I did everything I could to get out of it, but I'd said to the minister uh, that I'd go along when he agreed to marry us, and um, you might not believe it, but the city then was very much dick to me and packed, and my word is my bond, and I said I would go, and so I went, and then I went on another two because I took a bit of convincing. But, um, but once I realised that this was true, that we're not just singing songs to, an, to a God that doesn't exist, he exists, and the resurrection is true, and we looked at that this morning. There's so much evidence, but the fact is, most people uh, don't look at it, and I hadn't. I didn't come from a very, well, I didn't come from a Christian background uh, at all. None of my friends uh, were Christians, and uh, so it was all new to me. Anyway, eventually, I did, in this very poor, what these four people are doing tonight, and I got baptised here. I was a millennium baby, uh, because it was 2000, February 2000, and I was baptised. And for me, um, once once you have an experience of God, everything changes. We said this this morning, everything changes. Um, It doesn't mean it necessarily changes for the worse, and you're going to be sent off to somewhere and be a missionary, although you might. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it changes for the better in life. What it does change for the better is God is with you at all times and he has your eternity sorted out for you. And that's, that's amazing. But when you have this experience of God, when it becomes more than just reading the Bible and, and it seeming wooden, all of a sudden it came alive and it speaks and God speaks. It's just incredible. So I had this experience of God and then soon after, in my case this did happen, about a year after I felt a call to ministry and uh, I resigned from my job and this church, this very church, affirmed that. And I was sent off to ministerial recognition and various other places and trained uh, for ministry. And here I am, uh, 18 years later. You don't have to be good at maths when I said I was a millennium baby. It's very, really easy to work out with me. But once I knew the truth, once I knew the truth, then I saw the world through the lens of knowing God. It began to make sense because I don't think the world does make much, make much sense, uh, especially at the moment. There's a lot of confusion around, a lot of lies, um, a lot of spin, and yet... Once you know God, you can see the world through God's eyes. And it made 
it helped me make more sense of the world. It also, also made me realise uh, how lost I actually was. And you might be here tonight thinking, you don't make sense of the world or your life. You're not sure if you've got a purpose. You have. You have got a purpose. And that purpose is to have a relationship with God. And that comes first. Seek first the kingdom, the Bible says. And also immediately felt a real desire to tell other people. And I could walk down Billericay High Street and see the lostness in their faces. And I still do. And the Bible says that all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. And Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And he calls us by name to join him. So that was my journey as a bit of an introduction. I want to read uh, another journey to you from uh, the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8. And it's a story of Philip and an Ethiopian. And, uh, and we just see how he came uh, to faith. So I'm reading from Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official, in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? He immediately responded to the message he'd heard. And he gave orders to stop the chariot and then both Philip and the eunuch went down. They went down into the water. This is what these four people are going to do. They go down into the water. Went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So here we have this, uh, this passage, and I'll briefly go through it. We've got verse 28, uh, Ethiopian is reading Isaiah. That, uh, the book of Isaiah that he was reading was written around 700 years before, and it was the big prophecy uh, about Jesus. It started halfway through Isaiah 52, went all the way through Isaiah 53. And so when he says about the lamb being led to slaughter, that was Good Friday. You see, and now we've got Resurrection Sunday. And so the, the Ethiopian is interested. Many people, I find today, are interested in finding out real truth. There is a desire for truth in a world that sometimes has many lies. Many people today are interested in all sorts of spirituality. We are spiritual beings as well. And, and people look in the wrong direction, the wrong roads, false religions. Many, many ask the question, well, does God even exist? Or what about life after death? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said an outrageous claim, one that offends. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's an outrageous claim. You better mean it. And he proved it with the resurrection. He pointed to himself and said, he is the only way. And that's what these people are confessing tonight. And the passage the Ethiopian was reading was a prophecy about Jesus. Verse 34, the Ethiopian asks who the prophet was talking about. And Philip tells him the good news about Jesus. And that is the church's responsibility now. We've been given that mission. Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. He said, go out into all the world and make disciples, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're doing everything that God has asked us to do, and we're unashamed uh, about that as well. But the church has a responsibility to reach out. We're reaching out to you now, if you're sitting there and a non-believer, and we will give you the good news. That's what gospel means. It just means good news, and it is good news. And why is it good news? Because gospel, which literally means good news, it says, it starts with bad news, it says that we all get stuff wrong. So if I did a straw poll and said to all of you now, anyone ever not done anything wrong? If you put your hand up, you'd be lying. And that's wrong anyway. So you're stuffed. So we've all done wrong. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. So that's what it says, everybody. Not to, not to condemn us, because the Bible says Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save. But what is, he, what is he saving us from? You see, if God is a holy God, if he ignores the things we do wrong, what sort of God is he? 
It means he's just not bothered about the things that are wrong in the world. But he is bothered, and he's a loving God. So if I've, if I, the biblical word is sinned, if I've sinned, if I've done stuff wrong, then there's a barrier between me and God. I've tarnished the relationship. I've got children, I love them. Nothing, none of you will stop me love, loving them as uh, 100%. But if they do something wrong, the relationship is tarnished. It doesn't mean I love them any less. And what I long for them to do is come and say sorry so I can give them a hug and be restored. And uh, that's how God deals with his sons and daughters. He longs for us to be restored to him. And he wants us to remove, help us to remove that barrier and bring us back towards him. And so Jesus, especially at Easter when we talk about the cross, Jesus is the one who brings us back to God. He's the one who says, Ian, you did, you've done a lot wrong. And I have in the past. And I still get stuff wrong now, and so do you. But he sends Jesus to pay for that because someone's got to. And either I am or he is. And I can tell you, you want him to. You can refuse that, but then that means you've got to. And that's why he's called the Lamb of God, because in the Old Testament they used to sacrifice animals. But the Bible says in Hebrews 10, when this, when this high priest uh, went to the cross, it was done once and for all, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, whereas the other priests had to stand up day after day offering sacrifices. This one did it once and for all. It means we can have forgiveness, so my son running to me saying, sorry, I want to give him a hug and say, don't worry about it, we're fine. That's what God offers me. Reconciliation. He wants a relationship with us and he promises new life. And the Bible says, Jesus said, new life in all its fullness for his followers. Uh, the Bible calls them disciples. Disciple, I mean, the word just means apprentice. We look at somebody else and copy what he's doing and he gives his spirit, the supernatural uh, part of the Trinity of God into our lives to help us to live those lives. Brilliant. And so Easter Sunday which we uh, celebrate today, there's a passage where it says when, um, when, uh, what we're celebrating is that the curtain was torn in two. This curtain would have been over the height for this building. And it was a barrier between the people and God. No one could enter in unless they were really important, the, the high priest. But then the curtain was torn in two. And it meant that you can come to God directly through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Isn't that amazing? Why would nobody want that? If God exists, it's the most important question you can ever answer on this earth. And either, either I accept Jesus as my saviour or I've got to accept him as my judge. And you want him as your saviour. And he'll pay for those things. He removes the barrier of the things that uh, are caused by the things you did wrong. And a nation, we have to say our nation, has pretty much turned away from God. And what we'd like to think here, we, we want to help you find your way back. Without him, I can't make sense of this world. With him, I can see it. And there's so many people I come across who speak of an emptiness, and I try and tell them about Christ, and I say, yeah, but I just don't believe it. But they've never looked at the evidence. And Jesus says into that emptiness, it can only be filled by him. He says, I'm the bread of life. And he says, if you ask me, I'll come into your life. There's so many people living in darkness. And there's so many temptations for our young people, and all people, um, so much. And he says, but I'm the light of the world. He speaks light into that darkness. There's so many burdens and anxieties. And he says, well, come to me. Give them to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. But we try and carry it on ourselves. We can't. We can't cope. There's so many people looking for direction. And he says, well, I'm the way. He points to himself unashamedly. He says, I am the way. He says, I'm the good shepherd in those times. Uh, the shepherds, not like ours now, where we're, we're behind them with, you know, Shep and... Um, driving the sheep forward, the shepherds then would lead from the front. The sheep would just trust them and follow them. That's what God asks us to do in Christ. And so many of us, you know, the biggest, biggest fear of people, uh, actually they say, number one, is public speaking. It's not bad, is it? That means I'm brave. Um, I'm not really. Uh, the second thing is death. <coughs> second thing is death. We don't have to fear death, uh, not if we're Christians, because Jesus has sorted our eternity out, and it's a fact. It's a fact. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you want to have a relationship with God, which you are created for, you have to go to him. You have to go to him. So what do you do? Well, when Peter explained the good news earlier in this book, um, on that passage I read at the beginning, people were cut to the heart and asked, what shall we do? What shall we do? He's been saying to them, you know, you're loved, but you're guilty, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Accept what Christ has done. Receive forgiveness. And he says, repent, which means change your mind. Turn to God. Trusting what Christ has done on the cross for, he's paid for it. And then be baptised and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And people are being obedient to that tonight. And people, millions of people, doing that all over the world. 
Repent to turn away. For, to be able to say, along with Paul, for me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The baptism experience is an experience. It's an event between them and God. And then the Holy Spirit who comes, who equips and empowers and changes us to lead lives worthy of the calling we've received. The God who changes lives, I've seen it time and time again. A God of new beginnings. And obviously in the passage that we've just looked at, uh, Philip has explained this to the Ethiopian because in verse 36 he says, here is some water, why shouldn't I be baptised? And so many people give me reasons why they shouldn't be baptised. I'm not ready yet. Um, I'm not good enough yet. I haven't got it all sorted out yet. Nowhere does it say that in the Bible. Nowhere. What it says in the Bible is trust God, turn to God, repent, change your mind, turn to God, acknowledge him. Trust in what he's done on the cross for you, get baptised. You won't, you'll never be ready if you're trusting your own strength. What they're saying is, look, I'm coming because I know I need Christ to pay and I'm going to trust him. And it's, and it's a fantastic thing to do, to surrender. We don't like saying that word, but that's what we're doing. We're surrendering our lives back to him and saying we're going to live for him. But he doesn't leave us alone. He sends the Holy Spirit to help us live that life. And that's something that happens supernaturally. Uh, someone who want, make, makes you want to do the right thing. My best analogy of the, the people here... I've heard it many times. My dad was a carpenter. I was useless at woodwork. Um, I took woodwork at school. I failed the O-level. The only reason I took the woodwork is because I wanted to be like dad. He didn't get a Bible or the woodworking manual and whack it around my head and said, you better be like me. I just wanted to because I loved him. And when the Holy Spirit comes into us, he's going to make, he'll change us from the inside out. The prophets has all said that he'll put a new spirit within us. He'll write the law on our hearts. We'll want to become more like God. And so this Ethiopian, he's heard all of this, and they went down into the water, and he was baptised. So what's happening uh, when these guys do that today? Well, first of all, why do we do it? Uh, it's really easy. It's really difficult to argue against. Jesus taught baptism. Jesus, if we say he's Lord, if I say that's the one I want to follow, he says, do it. Um, he gave a clear instruction. When you're baptised as a believer, you're obeying Jesus' command. He said at the end of Matthew's Gospel, the last words he said to his followers in, in that Gospel, all authority, authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. If I'm saying Jesus is Lord, I need to get baptised. It's, just, it's really, that's a good enough reason. But not only that did he teach it, Jesus himself was baptised. He, he himself was baptised. He probably didn't need to be. But when he was questioned by John the Baptist, and, you know, we sh I shouldn't be doing this, I'm not worthy, he said, no, we've got to do this to fulfil all righteousness. So Jesus taught baptism, and Jesus, led by example, was baptised himself. The apostles taught baptism. Uh, Peter spelled it out in that, in that passage that I read, that uh, loads of people came to faith that day, um, and uh, it says over 3,000. And he baptised them all. If it wasn't urgent, he wouldn't have done them all on the same day. He would have had a little queue and done maybe 10 a day, which is probably what we would do. The first believers baptised all those 3,000 when Peter said, look, what you need is to turn to God and be baptised, be filled with the Spirit. It's fair to say the New Testament never sees baptism as an optional extra and nor did the believers need special guidance to see what was right for them as individuals. Believers' baptism was the standard practice. The New Testament shows us five dimensions of Christian initiation. It's repentance for past sins. It's saying sorry. So when my son comes up to me and says, Dad, I'm sorry, I just love him all the more. I don't say, you're saying sorry, I'm going to bash you around the head and really hurt you. I just say, great, thanks for saying sorry. I knew you did it already, but it's great that you've acknowledged that to me. Faith in Christ and what he's done on the cross... He's paid for it. It's done. I'm free. And I can move forward in Christ with confidence. Receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptised as a believer on my confession of faith, not, not anybody else's, and becoming part of the church. That's baptism. The Bible is clear. You won't find evidence in the Bible of a believer who didn't get baptised. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, it's not magic water. It's normal water. It's warm. Um, which is nice. Uh, I did do it one time and it burnt me. It was so warm. I, I haven't tested it today and I'm not getting in the water anyway, so I don't overly really care. I hope it's all right. Um, but um, Gary and Tom uh, will go in uh, with the people who are getting baptised. You'll hear testimony of how they got to this stage and then you hear four people make these promises before God, which is amazing. Amazing. And what it represents is a new birth. They die to their old self 
and they're raised with their new self. And then they can say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I've banked my life on that, as have many people here. My family, my work, my actions, my career, my deeds, my whole being has got to be about Christ. Otherwise, he's either true or he's not. Uh, he, can't be, he can't be a little bit true. Uh, it can't just be, oh, that truth's good for you, Ian. It's not my truth. It's either true or it's not. And I would encourage you, if you've never done it, to take one of our leaflets, get on the Alpha course. It's too important uh, to make a decision without me reading the small print. For me to live is Christ. Life found in Christ himself. And I'd ask you, you should be feeling alive today. This is a celebration, uh, Easter Sunday, really alive. And with God's spirit in you, you can feel that. And that's what these people are doing tonight. They're, they're, they're saying, I want to be reconciled to God, brought back to God. And the baptism represents that. And, and I've got to say, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust myself to pay for my wrongdoings? Or will I trust Christ? I choose life. I choose life. And I'd, 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 I'd recommend you do as well. Uh, you don't want to pay. Uh, let somebody else pay. Christ has died for you. Christ has come into this world to save sinners. Save them from the penalty of their wrongdoing. Because God is a holy God. He will not be mocked. And uh, his longing is that everybody, everybody would accept that message. So um, I'm going to pray for us now and then uh, Katie will lead us in some more worship and then we'll, we'll get these people up and uh, you'll see what it's all about. Father, we thank you for your word and its truth. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit now is working in the heart of everybody here, that we'd feel your presence as we worship. As we hear testimony, we'll, hear, we'll just really acknowledge the work that you're doing in people's lives. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and give you thanks. We thank you that your word says that when one person repents, there is a party in heaven. And we thank you that we can join in with that this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.